and welcome to Be a Social Media Rockstar, What Nonprofits Can Learn from Musicians. Hi everyone, I'm Stacy Guidis, Director of Agency Marketing for Grizzard, and I'll be our moderator today. I'd like to thank all of you aspiring rock stars for taking the time to join us for this webinar. So before we get to the good stuff, we have some housekeeping uh, to go over. Um, before we get started, I have a couple of things to optimize our sound and audio quality. All attendees are muted during the session. If for some reason you have the phone icon in your dialog box, please physically mute your phone. We encourage you to type your questions in the box, and we'll be answering some at the end. We'll see if you can stump Jeremy on those. Yes. Please participate in the polls during the webinar. I will put these out for your input from time to time. And also, please note that your GoToWebinar dialog box will minimize by default after a couple of minutes, but you can expand on it by clicking the orange box with the arrow pointing left. We're scheduled for 45 minutes with some time in the end for Q&A. And if you'd like to tweet your comments, please jump in and do so. Use the hashtag SMRockstar. So I'm excited to have with us presenting today Jeremy Hazelwood, our Manager of Digital Strategy. And he's going to come up on screen shortly. Jeremy has been with us for about a year now, and we're lucky to have him. He has a lot of po positive energy that he's brought to the agency. Jeremy works on digital fundraising strategy for a variety of our clients, the goal of which is, of course, to help boost donor revenue, awareness, and engagement. He has extensive industry expertise in social media monitoring, online marketing, behavioral targeted display ads, search engine marketing, mobile marketing, and multi multimedia online tools. That's a lot of fun stuff. Before Grizzard, Jeremy was with the great AT&T, where he honed his skills managing marketing programs for Wyndham Worldwide Company. And this is really cool about Jeremy. Before working at AT&T, he was founding owner of Tenth Planet Productions, a pop and urban music entertainment company, hence the musician tie-in with this webinar. At Tenth Planet, he provided social media, digital, and marketing communications for musicians and bands. Jeremy said this was great work. And this is also really awesome. Jeremy's a rock star himself. Yes. Not really. <laughs> but you will see his stage presence in just a minute. But he is a musician, and this is very awesome. He is a voting member of the Grammy Awards. So thank you for rocking us today, Jeremy. Say hi to your groupies. Hello, everybody. I hear the crowds roaring. I can hear them roaring. They just can't hear it. And so I've got a 10-second elevator speech about Grizzard, just for those of you who are not familiar with us. Grizzard Communications Group partners with more than 1,400 nonprofits in North America, more than any other agency. We have raised more than $4 billion since 1919 when the agency was founded. We have 200 associates nationwide. And we help our clients improve results by building passionate and loyal donors. And we do that with better messaging, digital integration, that Jeremy's going to talk about, and multi-channel fundraising strategies. So without further ado, I'd like to give the stage to Jeremy. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jeremy Hazelwood, and thank you, Stacy, for the introduction. So I did get dressed up for this uh, webinar today. So the picture on the left is my rock star look that I'm, I'm dressed in right now just for this webinar so I could really be in full mode. Uh, Stacy told you a little bit about uh, my previous um, history. So I have a background in marketing, social media, and also the music industry. And um, so I don't really need to say anything else about myself. If you want to learn more, you can go to JeremyHazelwood.com. And also, I'll be reminding you all throughout this to join the conversation on Twitter because I know we have some people that will be joining the call uh, throughout the, the webinar here. So it's pound uh, SM Rockstar. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's move along. And we're going to start out with a question. And the question that we're going to ask is, how much of a social media rock star are you? And so we'll put this up, and you'll be able to vote. This may be the most important question that's ever asked in your life. So please select one of these, your top of the charts, 
you're still climbing, you're a wannabe, or you have stage fright. So what level of social media rock star? And if you don't consider yourself a social media rock star, think of this as how good at social media are you? Because some of you all may be rock stars and don't even know it. Right we'll give you a moment here to submit your responses. I think everyone's done voting, so we'll share the results. All right, so here are the results. So we have 13% who are the top of the charts. Hopefully, you all will gain something from the webinar today. And it looks like about 84% are still climbing and wannabes, and a couple have stage fright. So the good thing about it, this presentation, it, it really, you'll be able to take something from this, whether you're just beginning to learn about social media or whether or not you are just a, an incredible social media expert, because there's a lot of things in here that will hopefully challenge you and uh, give you some new ways to really approach and, and new thoughts and concepts that you can take from this. So we're going to start out um, with the agenda. And there's a bit of a delay here from when I push the button to what you see on your screen, so I'll wait for it to advance. Okay, so we're going to start out today. We're going to talk a little bit about social media history from a different perspective, and then timeless social media tips for nonprofits, and then we're going to conclude today's session. So social media history, a different perspective. And with having a background in the music industry, you're going to hear the bias history that I'm going to provide. So let's take a look at just leveling out the playing field here. Let's talk about an organization. This could be any organization. It could be your organization. But an organization starts out with a goal. And so uh, what a lot of people won't tell you is that um, rock stars, nonprofits, they all should have goals. And then we look at the money piece. This organization, every penny goes back into the organization. Every money that you earn is, is going back in. You're not really able to invest in a whole lot of new things to support your business or support yourself. And then we look at a human capital piece to this. And human capital being really the heart and soul of the success of this organization. And then, of course, we would like to hope that you have some kind of an organizational structure. So this all sounds very business oriented. And then we also have a competition for voice. See the guy screaming here. He's just wanting to be heard. We all want to be heard. And then, of course, there are the fanatics. This person is passionate about their cause. And so does any of this sound familiar? Because if it does, I'm talking about rock stars. They have an organization, they have people who are central to what they're doing, they want their voice to be heard, and they are passionate about what they're doing. But this could also be talking about your nonprofit. So see, there's really not that much difference between the two, and that's why we wanted to bring these two cool concepts together. So once this happened, what happened next? When we look at the history of social media, these organizations wanted to be heard, musicians wanted to be heard, so you know, blogs were nothing new back in say the late 90s but that's when the content for blogs really started to develop and online communities start to develop you have like the geo cities and friendster high five and other niche sites that really paved the way for some of these online communications but one of the main things that was really holding this back was it was still predominantly a one-way communication and they're really from a peer-to-peer -peer piece it was good but it wasn't necessarily great for uh, bands or even businesses to speak. It was more just kind of a grassroots level. And so then what happened next? Corporations, um, actually before the corporations, we looked at the way musicians took a hold of what became social media. And this was largely due to the popularity of MySpace. And so through this, they were able to generate fans. They were able to have two-way conversations. They were able to get personal with people that visited their page or people that they wanted to reach out to. They were able to frequently update their online presence. They were able to target the audiences that they really wanted to go after because of different filtering that they could do online when they're searching for who they might feel is a, an appropriate fan for their music. And then they also branded what they were doing, whether it be the image you can see here, like this is a, a girl band, but even their image is a brand. And you look at the names of albums, the way their logos were shaped, and the types of guitars that they had. It was all a part of their branding. 
and then ultimately they were able to monetize what they were doing. And so you really see the progression of entering into the, the stage, so to speak, to building up your base to now being able to convert those fans and making money off of it. And so before this, there really wasn't a, an outlet. You had, you know, maybe authors that were able to write books and blogs and, and generate some revenue that way. But when we look at really being a rock star and even transitioning that to the nonprofit or the corporate world, you know, we're really looking at this being, I like to consider them the godfathers and godmothers of social media. So corporations took note and they followed suit with what the musicians did, but they actually have a budget, whereas musicians don't really have a budget. It's, you know, whatever they make working at McDonald's or waiting tables, they're putting back in the business. And so corporations had very large budgets. But the question was, how could a company take the same approach and connect with people the same way that musicians do in these online communities? And so that will, will, is what will lead us into five timeless social media tips for nonprofits. And the cool thing about this, that these five items I'm going to go over, these really haven't changed a whole lot really since MySpace started. I know it's kind of old school now that it's 2013, but a lot of these foundations are things that nonprofits should be doing right now in order to really get their organization out there and get the, the troops rallied behind their cause. So the first one we're going to start with is keeping it fresh. So you've all heard content is king, and many of you have probably heard that so much that you want to bang your head on the table every time you hear it because you hear it so much. And I don't necessarily agree that content is king. I think content is incredibly important, but it is only king, so to speak, if your content is relevant, if it's engaging, if it's updated, and if it's not overdone. And part of this had came about from... Let's look at Google, for example. There were a lot of ways that you could trick Google. So, you know, let's say that your cause was uh, cancer. People were searching fighting cancer. And you could put within your website fighting cancer a hundred times, and it would make your website more relevant. And so that used to be able to trick Google in, in helping you online. Um, however, that's not the case anymore. You can't trick Google in that way because now by doing something like that on your website, you'll actually – it's going to hurt your search engine rankings. And you'll also um, lose interest online with too much content that has nothing to do with anything your audience even cares about. So uh, if you're using keywords and putting a bunch of those in even your social media or your website that don't really have much to do with your cause, that, that's not really going to help you out. Uh, but an example I use in the commercial world, if you look at a company like Groupon, they found a way to keep it fresh and they delivered a new deal every day. Wow, how innovative is that? And people just opted into these email lists. They were able to build up their subscriber base because it was something that was, they were getting new and fresh and exciting deals every day. But that also had its drawbacks too, and I'll get on that a little bit later. So what did musicians do when it comes to this? They created content. They had new songs that they would come out with. They would have exclusive songs for different sites. Maybe SoundCloud would have some sites. Maybe MySpace would have sites. Maybe Reverb Nation. There's a lot of sites that cater to musicians, but they might do exclusive songs just for certain um, social media sites. And they can also create videos. Uh, they kept blogs of, you know, maybe being on the road or being in the studio or making the album or maybe, you know, some cause that they care about to, to get support for that. They would have contests. People got to name their albums, maybe name the name of a song that was untitled, you know, giving away iPads for, you know, the first maybe 200 people that purchased the album. And they also sought you out. They didn't wait for you to necessarily find them. You know, they would go and they would look for people if they're targeting teenage girls because they know that that's going to be their fan base. You know, they can filter 13 to 18 year old girls and they can go after them and, you know, let's say it's Atlanta, Georgia. And then they actually, you know, connected with people. So they were able to send notes and, you know, maybe say happy birthday to people if they saw what their birthday was. So what can you do as an organization um, for social media? Give visitors a reason to come back. Uh, creating and publishing relevant and or local content. If you have a local um, nonprofit, you know, publishing content that's maybe relevant to that community community that you live in. And some of those pieces of content could be pictures, video, uh, maybe there's some events that are going on that you want to talk about, how to volunteer, how to uh, 
uh, you know, what the dates will be, what the times will be, and maybe there's some exclusive things that you can give away for your uh, Twitter account versus your Facebook account. And then also, um, you have an opportunity to cross-link, mention, converse, and say thanks to people who are following you on Twitter or your friends on Facebook. So, you know, if someone makes a comment on one of your posts, actually go to their page instead of, you can thank them there for their comment, but go to their page and say, hey, thanks, you added a great comment to our page today. You know, thanks for being our friend. Because how, how awesome would it be if everybody on this phone and even here in the room with me, if, if I had an organization come to my page and they took the time out to do that, like that, there, there's an emotional connection that builds there that you're not really going to get with a lot of companies or organizations. So that will lead us to our next poll question. So get ready to answer. Do you have a social media content calendar? And that's pretty easy. Yes, you do. You kind of do or not yet. I'll give you a second to answer that. Still got some voters. Okay, I think we're done. We're done? Okay. So let's look at the results. So 23% have a calendar, which is great. 23% uh, don't have a calendar, or actually, I'm sorry, 23 kind of have one. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe there's a calendar sometimes. Maybe you just don't do a good job of keeping up with it. And then 55% not yet. So, you know, one of the cool things, actually, Grizzard, we actually do social media calendars uh, for our clients that are doing our social media services. And the importance of this is, you know, putting a strategy behind what you're saying because social media, either you're, you're going to do it all the way or you're, you're going to, I, I hate to say fail, but you're not going to have optimal results. It's something that you really have to pay attention to because it is a community and you have to be present. It's kind of like the lotto. You know, you have, to be, you have to be present to win. I guess that wouldn't be like the lotto. So, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so, um, so that's an important thing is really planning out your posts and having a whole schedule and look at what holidays are coming up look at what kind of messaging that you want to include uh, day in and day out. And that way you're not scrambling every day to come up with new content. You want it to be something that's engaging and something that will get people to like it or retweet it. All right, so we will move on to the next one here. Sorry, I was waiting for this slide to load. Okay, so tip number two is fish where there are fish. And I like to just say fish where the fish are, but you're not supposed to end a sentence in R. Uh, so we're going to talk about the great migration. And the reason I talk about this, many musicians abandon their own websites to put more resources into their social media sites. And so why would they do something like that? And this is because their site was getting little to no traffic. You know, if you have some just local band that nobody knows about, they're not getting a lot of traffic. But social network sites were getting millions of people logging in per day. And they needed to be where the people were if they wanted to get word out about their product, which was their CD, their downloads, their concerts, their merchandise. And plus, many social media sites have tools that allow you to filter users by demographics, which is an easy way to connect to your audience. Uh, but not every site is going to have the audience that you want to target. So how well do you know your target donors? and also your new donor opportunities, you know, really finding which sites might be the best one for you. I mean, definitely we know that Facebook should be an integral part of your campaign, but when you look at, you know, maybe Tumblr or a site like uh, Pinterest, you know, is that good for your audience or not? And, and it really depends on your organization. So what do musicians do? They paid attention to trends. They were early adapters. They uh, recognized how they could really get more visibility. They abandoned their own websites. I'm not suggesting that any organization abandon their website because it's actually a, it's a very key and necessary thing for your organization. But you do need to be you know you do need to be fishing where the fish are. And bands claim their online real estate, so they would go to all these different sites and at least register their name just to kind of stake their claim in the ground. And then they turned on the microphone and became social, meaning they started to talk to people, they started to blog, and they, they started to have a voice in the social media world. So what can you do? You can claim your online real estate as well. And I'm sure most of you all probably have Facebook. A large majority probably have Twitter. But you, you may want to go ahead and, and lock down some of these other sites, your, your Pinterest, your Tumblr, 
um, and, and just make sure that your username on all of these sites is the same because people will tie that to your brand in social media. So if you haven't done that, you know, there's some sites that you can search on Google and maybe look at like the top 20 social network sites and at least just set up an account on there. You know, Google Plus, make sure that you have your, at least your name set up on there so people can find you. And uh, again, determining which sites are best for your organization and figure out what you're going to say really how you're going to say it and why you're going to say it. Everything that you say is going to be public now. So you want to make sure that whatever you're saying is relevant to your audience. So that's part of that turning on the microphone and being social. Once you establish this footprint, it's time to start the real work of keeping the conversation going. So tip number three is never fear creativity. So if you look at this picture, you look at this rock star diving off the stage. So in a digital world, the playing field gets leveled at an extremely rapid rate. So in my opinion, creativity and innovation will be the only differentiator between you being another face in the crowd and earning reverence as a rock star organization. And successful indie musicians did it differently online and offline. You went to their website or their social network page and you saw something new and you said, wow, now that is cool. And it's the same with nonprofits and social media. Even if you have a similar cause as somebody else, you want people to look at something that you did and say, wow, did you see what organization XYZ did? That was genius. That was really cool what they did. And you have people talking about you. And it shouldn't be considered luck when this happens. Uh, so you want to make sure that you do have something and, and challenge yourself. What are you doing to separate your messaging and personality through social media from what your competitors are doing, um, especially in this nonprofit world, everybody's organization is important. You know, your your cause is important, and even if there are two different competing societies or, or organizations that support the same cause, you know, you you still want to differentiate yourself. So, what do musicians do? And this is a picture of uh, Bjork. So, and many musicians they inject their own personality, and these are the most memorable musicians, oftentimes. And they tell the same story, but in a new and memorable way. I mean, people have been making love songs for hundreds of years, and there's really not a whole lot new that you can say or sing about love. But somehow, musicians come up and they put a different spin on it, tell it from a different perspective, put some different instruments behind it, and now it's like a number one hit. And also, musicians dress differently. You know, think about you know, some of the biggest rock stars of all time. Even currently, you, you look at like the Lady Gaga's and, and Nicki Minaj who are just like extremely out there with the way that they dress. But people know who they are. And, and, and we're not necessarily saying that's the look that you want to have for your organization. But people know who they are and that's a part of their brand. And so we want to hope that when people think of your brand, they actually think something positive about what you're doing. So what can you do? You want to try something new and memorable. And I, I can't tell you what that is for your organization, but it's really just a challenge to maybe set aside a brainstorming meeting and, and think of just some off-the-wall ideas. And, and no idea is a bad idea. Just throw everything out there and, and see what can be developed. And don't be afraid of failures. You know, one of the things that I've seen is because budgets are so tight that it, it's very conservative um, in the nonprofit world with taking chances. But there's a lot that you can learn by that, and, and you can also gain a whole lot um, through taking those chances. And if you do fail, you can blog about it. And that's more content that you've created for your website or your social media. And so that's something that people will be able to connect with you to say, oh, well, you know, they've tried something and they didn't succeed this go around, but they're not giving up and they're going to, to try something else. And then if you have um, Google Analytics, which if you don't, I would recommend that you, you do get, uh, look at your website. And, and also even on Facebook, there's some analytics that can track, you know, your, the reach of your messages, you know, how many times people have liked your content. So look at your analytics and see what's performing or what's not performing um, on Twitter, what's getting retweeted, you know, on Facebook, what kind of content is getting liked. So, you know, you really want to look at if you think you put together this really awesome message and nobody commented on it, and nobody liked it, nobody shared it. Either maybe you put it out at the wrong time of day, or maybe it just really wasn't that good of a message. So you really need to pay attention to that so you don't do that again. 
And then the whole idea, instead of thinking, you know, are we thinking too big, you should shift to, are we thinking too small? You know, reach beyond what you're, you're used to doing and get out of your comfort zone because that is when you're going to experience the most growth. And I, I can vouch for that personally. Whenever I'm comfortable, I, I've stopped growing. So I have to move on, and it's the same with any business. So tip number four is know what you are measuring. And one of the quotes that I like is, hope is not a strategy. And I'm, I'm not taking claim to that. I know a few people have said that, so I can't actually credit the correct person for saying that. But it is 100% true. You know, hope is, is not a strategy. Strategy has tactics and objectives and goals. So what did musicians do? They measured. They established key performance indicators, or maybe they didn't establish them up front, but they knew what they were measuring. It maybe was never written down, but they knew they could tell their success by their chart position. You know, you look at some of the niche social media sites for musicians and they can look at where they are nationally, internationally, locally, and in their city. They can see where their position is on the chart. So they're measuring that. They're measuring how many times their songs got played, uh, looking at the, the number of, of song increases on audio players, the number of video plays on YouTube, the number of friends and followers and comments. I mean, all of these things musicians can measure and kind of pat themselves on the back and say, wow, we did it. We got 200 people that watched our video last month. And then also they measured by monetizing so they could see how much money they made, which is pretty important to any organization, be it a, a band or a nonprofit. So they were able to look at album sales, how many downloads they had. And we, what we like to say in the music world is merch. So that's your merchandise. So what can your organization do? It all goes back to one of the things that I learned in school, which was what gets measured gets done. And so you want to look at up front before you do anything or after you come up with these ideas, establish how you're going to measure it. Establish your KPIs, which are your key performance indicators. And then once you establish what those are going to be, you want to create the tactics that you're going to do that will move the needle on these KPIs. How are you going to know whether you were a success or not? And that all comes through really benchmarking. And maybe you have to run through a few, uh, we'll call them business cycles, in order to establish what your benchmarks will be. But you want to measure your success. And after that, you want to celebrate your success. And this is something that I've been kind of preaching a whole lot more because we get so caught up in the work that we do that we don't take time to really look at the success we have and, and just celebrate it amongst your team. You know, if, if it's someone that works for you, reward them because there, there's a lot of opportunities to celebrate that can really invigorate your team and your organization. But once you do that, it's time to retool and get back to work. And just remember that what got you here may not get you there. So basically the strategy you used up to this point, you need to continue to evaluate that strategy and make sure that that's really still going to work for your organization because technology changes fast, new social media sites pop up, so you want to make sure that what you're doing is going to evolve with the times. All right, so tip number five, know when enough is enough. I told you we'd get back to Groupon, and probably most of us have used a daily deal at some point within the past couple of years. But there was this thing that became known as deal fatigue. So you had your Groupon deals. It was relevant content. It was sent frequently. It was sent every day. Maybe you had Groupon, maybe Living Social, um, Yelp. There's all these different daily deal sites, Half Off Depot, and, and there's a lot of local ones depending on where you live. And it was great at first because it's like, wow, I've got this new deal, and you're excited about it because it's, it's a new piece of content. And, but over time... It, you just got bombarded with messages and now you're on like 10 daily deal lists and it's just way too much and it's deal fatigue and now you've started to tune out what the deals are and, and to a point where you don't even want the deal anymore. You just would rather eliminate all these people from emailing you and just pay full price somewhere. So what did musicians do? So what happens when the new car smell wears off? So early on musicians, they would you know, send messages to everybody or post on people's sites, hey, check out my new song, hey, um, check out this show in your area. And it's, I mean, even just from my experience, I can't tell you how many notes that I would get on social media sites from people wanting me to check out something. And it just became so much that, 
you know, I would unfriend these people. That's where you see the great unfriending or cousin ig, which is ignore. So I started to ignore these messages, and, and that's the same with you. You start to ignore when it becomes just too much, whether it's, you know, you're getting emails every day or you're getting the same person email you every day or not email but post something on your social media site. You have a friend that maybe they're texting you something every day. It's just you, you start to ignore it and you try to hide from these people. So musicians had to find what communication frequency worked and also discover which content resonated most with fans. And one thing that we know, and this holds true for any organization on social media, images are resonating with people online. And, and you've seen a lot of changes. You've seen like Pinterest just explode the past year and a half because it's image heavy. Facebook has now has, has their image search and they've changed their format to where images are going to play a heavier role in the way that Facebook is presented. So you want to have some compelling images and you've probably seen these memes where it's like a picture of something that has some funny or some inspirational words on it and about 80% of them have kittens on it. Now, kittens are hot right now. So I'm not saying that everybody go out and make your, your kitten meme. I'm just sharing what's going on right now. So what can you do? So test communication. And for those of you who recognize this machine at the bottom, it is a Scantron machine. And you can see it's grading the test. So when you're testing your social media communication, uh, similar to testing an email, you want to test the time of day, the day of week, and the type of subject material that you're pushing out across your social media channels. And so you want to really, you know, test and see which ones are getting the most response. You know, who's commenting the most? Do you get more comments around 11 a.m. or 8 a.m.? You know, what day of the week are you getting the most? And you have to, and you can't do this testing unless you have a consistent social media program. And that's where the importance of developing a calendar comes to play. And so you also want to monitor the frequency of your communication. So do you lose likes and do you lose followers from certain types of posts? So, I mean, this is kind of getting a little further into it, but from an analytics piece, looking at, you know, even if you have every day, you're monitoring how many likes you have. And let's say one day you have 5,820 likes, and then the next day you have 5,811 likes. So you lost nine people that day. So was there a message that you posted that maybe people didn't like very much, and so they don't like your organization anymore? So these are certain things that you want to pay attention to. And then, as I like to say on social media, keep your palms to the side, not up. Because if you have your palm to the side, which I bet many of you right now are looking at your palm to the side, and then you're looking at it up. And so to the side means you're, you're welcoming somebody. You're reaching out. You're greeting somebody. You're shaking their hand. And, of course, when you have your palm up, it's give me. You know, donate to this. Donate to that. Please help with this. And you have those appeals. So... It's okay to ask for things on social media, but the mix of messages, it should be very minimal how you do that. You should not use social media as a primary way to raise funds or to gain volunteers. You want to build relationships on social media and get people vested in your organization, and then you can reach out, you know, and mix those messages in. You do want to ask for some donations and volunteering, but that shouldn't be the main purpose that you're doing social media. All right, so now we have a question. And I believe, is this our last question? Yes, this is our last question. So it is your last chance for your voice to be heard. So do you test and monitor your social media posts? Yes, always. Yes, we've done some testing and monitoring. Or no, not yet. And it's okay. There, everybody is anonymous, so nobody will be called out. And also, as a reminder, I know we have a few minutes left here, but you can join the conversation on Twitter at pound social media rockstar. Well, actually, I'm sorry, SM rockstar. All right. So we have the results. They have been posted. We have 11 percent of the, the people on the call are always monitoring. 41% uh, do some testing and monitoring, and 49% are not monitoring yet. So it really shows, you know, an opportunity. And, again, this is a, a webinar put on by Grizzard, and I was not told to plug anything, but I wasn't told not to plug anything. But I will say we do social media monitoring if you need some assistance with that. So there will be some ways that you can reach out to us, uh, contact information at the end of this webinar. So 
I would just like to say in conclusion, I would like to end this uh, webinar with a challenge to you. I would like for you to take something that you learned today and put it into effect tomorrow. So we went over a lot of information, a lot was uh, more conceptual, and I really wanted to keep it kind of high level and conceptual as opposed to getting too heavy into the tactics um, because this way I think a lot more people can relate to it. Uh, but just take a look at everything that we talked about. And if there's just one thing that you could do tomorrow or next week, you know, write that down and pursue that and, and start to build out that plan. And then take the lessons that you learned from our band camp here today and become social media rock stars with your nonprofit. So with that, I want to thank you all for joining this webinar. I'm Jeremy Hazelwood. There is my Twitter handle. It's at Jeremy Hazelwood. That's with an S, not a Z. And I also want to mention uh, we do have some upcoming webinars. We have Growing with New Generations of Support with Flowers of Hope experiential fundraising which will be April 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and integrated animal care fundraising Bow Wow April 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time you can register for both of these at Grizzard.com and I believe we're opening it up for Q&A now yes we are thank you Jeremy that was awesome sure thank you and we do have a couple of questions here um, okay, the first one. With, uh, with limited resources, what percent of our organization's time and marketing budget should we allocate to social media? Okay, and in terms of a, a marketing budget, it really, marketing budgets can vary so much. It could be $500, it could be $5 million. So I can't really tell you what percentage of your marketing budget um, that you have but it's something where if, if you are really serious about this we could definitely talk to you about what your goals are um, you know with Grizzard we can talk to you about that and find out what we could do you know what kind of budget could you put aside for something like this and really get the most for whatever your budget is okay great um, here's a very specific one what are the top five um, social media that you recommend okay I would say uh, Facebook, Twitter, sorry I'm writing these out as I'm thinking them, uh, YouTube, uh, Google Plus, and Pinterest. Is that five? That's it. But I would also say look at Tumblr as well. And a bonus. Uh, yeah, and a bonus. You ask for five, I give you six. Okay, great. Um, okay, and the last questions, last question. Uh, musicians are creative, but we're not. Do you have any ideas um, where our ideas should come from? How do we get ideas? I guess is the point of it. So how do you how do you give birth to creativity when there is no creativity? Um, but I would say this. I mean, there's definitely. I think people are more creative than they realize. If you have an organization or you're a part of it, there's somebody in your organization who who has a vision and they had a vision enough to create this organization um, so I would say and depending on the size of your organization too you know very small organizations you know may just be a handful of people that work there so again Grizzard we have creative people if it's something that you wanted to consult with us about putting something together for you um, but if not I mean goodness you look at social media and the scary thing is you have like most people's kids nowadays are like the creative force behind uh, their parents social media stuff so you know you can just kind of talk to if you have children talk to them ask what what they would find interesting you know what's something that that they think would be uh, cool to do or, or cool to add um, because that's you, you really have to leverage that you know we have different generations who want to be communicated to in a different way so ask your friends about what are some things that you might want to see us do with our organization and so you can, and again, those brainstorming meetings where if you get a whole bunch of people who are not creative in a room together, there will be some creative ideas that come out of it. Okay, super. Good advice. Sure. Um, okay, well, I think we're good for today. Uh, that's all. We've got a little more time, but I think we're, we're good, and I think everybody will appreciate some extra time here. We are going to post a recording of this presentation along with the PDF of the slides. 
on grizzard.com. It'll take us a day or so to get it up. Um, we will send you an email with a link to it as soon as those are online, and maybe by the end of this week. So thank you, everyone, and hope the rest of your day rocks. All right. Thank you all.